Arguably the biggest and most fatal mistake I made when first starting out with the farm. So in my five plus years of being a beginning farmer, I have made an insane number of mistakes. And in today's video, which is sponsored by Magic Spoon, I'm gonna break down the eight biggest ones for you. And if you stick around until the end, I'll also give you a list of the five best decisions I ever made on the farm. Let's go. All right, so mistake number one actually starts out here in the permaculture orchard. I know it's kind of hard to see right now with all the fog, but we have this area that's, I don't know, about eight plus acres of space. And inside this area, when I first got started with the farm, I began planting a whole bunch of trees. And after years of patience, I finally feel like it's paying off and you can see some of these trees are getting pretty gosh darn big. Here we got an apple tree. Here we got a chestnut tree. Over here is a black locust tree. Here's another little apple tree that's growing by Abby's butt. Here's a gigantic black locust tree that might be nearing 20 feet tall. Now planting these trees very, very early on after I purchased the farm was a really good decision. So that's not what I'm critiquing. The thing I'm critiquing and wish I did differently is this trench that you see here. You see, particularly in permaculture design, there's this concept of using swales and berms to help grow plants, particularly trees. You see, the premise is that water's gonna run down the hill and go down here, and it used to always flood really bad. It still kind of floods really bad. And the thinking was that inside the ditch part of it, the swale, it would catch water. And then with the raised up earth that we left when we dug the swales and berms, what you're gonna do is you're gonna be able to actually trap that water in this space. And so the idea was that I would have these little channels or streams that would capture water. It could be a place for my ducks to swim and play, but then it would actually provide extra water for the trees that I was growing here. And now the other thing that you're gonna notice as we zoom out and look at the aerial view is that they're not done in a straight line. They're done on a curve. That's because they're done on something known as contour, which means I basically took a laser level and figured out the level point all along the slope of this hill and we dug the swales and berms so that they would be perfectly level. That way the water wouldn't travel down or in any one direction, but rather the water would stay trapped in the swales and berms. And for a beginner trying to mark and then ultimately dig swales and berms, I think we did a pretty darn good job of building these out because they are pretty level. The problem is they're not a straight line and it essentially makes it virtually impossible to maintain these permaculture orchard. You know, trying to mow the grass with like say a brush hog on this curving sloping lines that I have is very complicated and hard. As I've grazed cattle in this area, setting fence lines is very difficult and time consuming. And so all in all, if I had a do-over, I would probably not dig the swales and berms and I would focus on planting my trees in straight rows that would be easier to maintain. And while it's not permaculture perfect and you might lose a little bit of water capture that I gain by having all these swales and berms, I think I think the benefit of being able to easily mow and mulch the area in here would have made my trees grow faster. And as I'm starting to make some plans to plant more trees up on the top of the pasture in the new grazing area where the cattle are right now, I'm very much thinking about how do I do it all in very straight lines that are easy to maintain. As it stands right now, I'm using what's known as the Mark Shepard stun method, strategic total utter neglect, which essentially dictates that you kind of let your trees do what they will and let nature take its course and you do certain small things like planting trees as well as maybe a little bit of mulching early on to help promote the growth of the trees. But what you're really looking for are trees that are going to survive and thrive in this type of system because that's the type of tree that's naturally suited for what you've got going here on your farm. I'll say that the other thing I've done is I've just like let nature take its course and do its thing and so I've got trees like those birch trees right there that are popping up. There's some sumac back there. Down right here you can see a volunteer apple tree. Because it's so hard to mow and maintain these swales and berms, I've just let them become essentially wilderness patches that sit in between the pasture on the slope of the permaculture orchard. This means it's very much become a science experiment and I'm very curious to see what this is gonna look like five or 10 years from now. And I hope to be sort of a lesson for folks who are watching our videos and saying, oh, you should never just neglect little strips like that in your pasture, or maybe it's exactly what you should do. But regardless, carving up these swales and berms was a massive, massive mistake. So when I first started making videos of me farming, one of the biggest criticisms people would often put on me 
is they were shocked to see me carrying buckets of water out to my ducks every single morning. And I would always have arguments with people in the comments who would be like, oh, that's stupid. You should get some hoses and do an actual watering system. And I'd be like, no, 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 I'm fine. I'm doing it just the way I think I should do it. But here I am five years later, ready to admit my mistake and say, I was a dang fool for not trying to set up a watering system sooner. You see, the way this works is, that water hydrant goes all the way back to the farm gate. And essentially with the flip of a switch, all I have to do is turn it on and I get free flowing water that I can run out here and just use hoses to fill up these tubs for the birds. Like I'm gonna guess that I probably use about 50 or 60 gallons of water every day just for the ducks and geese. If I was filling up these pools with buckets, it would probably take me, I don't know, half an hour, 40 minutes every day just to get water out to my ducks and geese. When with the setup that I have right now, I don't know, it probably takes me roughly five minutes, 10 minutes to fill up the water pools just for the ducks and geese. And it becomes an easy chore where I can also look for duck eggs or maybe feed the ducks. And so it's not a difficult exercise at all. And so I say all of this to you guys to say that as you're thinking about your farm operations or setting up a homestead, please fully recognize that power and water infrastructure infrastructure is like a force multiplier and it's going to make your job infinitely easier as you start to try raising animals. And I remember I was scared away from the idea of trying to do power and water infrastructure too early on because I wasn't sure exactly how things were going to lay out and I was afraid of the cost. But once I actually investigated say digging a trench for running a water line or putting out sort of summer watering out here that just basically sat on the ground and all it required was some black piping, I now recognize how how much easier it made my job. And it's a secret to how I was ultimately able to scale the farm up from going from about 40 ducks to, I don't know, these days I probably have about 30 ducks, 90 geese, nearly a dozen cattle, a couple of pigs, a bunch of chickens. Like I wouldn't be able to do all of that stuff as one guy if I didn't have the efficiency factor gained from using water infrastructure and power infrastructure to make my job easier. Okay, so now you guys are probably wondering what bad decision number three was here on the farm. And well, bad Bad decision number three has to do with business plans. Not a week doesn't go by when I don't get an email from a viewer asking me to give very, very detailed cost breakdowns in terms of what I make from my farm, what I made in the early years, whether it's the trees, whether it's the ducks, whether it's the beef. People always want my numbers to make a business plan so that they can plan for themselves and how they want to start their own farm. And to be quite honest, I rarely, if ever, give that information out really for two reasons. Number one, I'm horrible at responding to emails and so I usually like open the email and then mean to respond to the email but then forget to respond to the email and then it just sort of disappears into the ether. But then reason number two is that building business plans for farms, particularly if you're a beginning farmer and you're doing something unconventional, is a wildly experimental exercise and I would feel like I would be doing somebody a disservice if I gave them my numbers for planning purposes and they went out and they quit their job and they took out their savings and maybe he took out a loan from a bank and went off to try to create this business. And meanwhile, what worked for me and what made sense for me could turn into a dismal failure for that person. And then I would feel personally culpable for that great life failure for that person. And, and so I just don't want that responsibility and I don't want to lead anybody astray or sell them a false premise. For example, when I first started my farm, my vision was I was going to raise ducks for eggs. My thinking was that there were a lot of people in this area who raised raise chickens for eggs, but not a lot of people who raise ducks. And if I focused on raising ducks and figured out a way to be the guy who raises ducks the best around this area, I could make a thriving business by charging a premium for duck eggs. I truly am a believer in the principle that it is better to be different than it is to be better. And so back in 2018, I started raising ducks for eggs. And what I found is that idea was an abysmal failure. You know, number one, Ducks love to hide their eggs in weird places. And usually when you find those duck eggs, they end up pretty filthy. There's a couple more this morning. And then number two, not a lot of people actually wanted to buy duck eggs. They were weirded out by it. Like if I actually wanted to be successful with selling duck eggs here in Northern Vermont, I was gonna actually have to educate my consumers and build a market to be able to sell these eggs. And to be perfectly honest and transparent, that's why I started making these YouTube videos was because I wanted to like try to educate people about my ducks. So 
so that when I had the eggs to sell that they'd be willing to buy them. The irony is that the videos that I made became way more popular and lucrative than the egg business ever was. And so yes, five years later, I'm still raising ducks and I'm still selling duck eggs, but the reality is my business looks drastically different than anything I had ever envisioned on paper. And if I had like done the cash flow analysis for what this would have looked like, I probably would have never started in the first place. If you're starting a farm business, recognize that number one, your business won't look like anybody else's. And then number two, know that it's very, very difficult to create a market niche that doesn't currently exist. I am not saying that it can't be done, but what I am saying is that it's very, very difficult. And if you're a beginning farmer and you're just learning how to do your farm stuff, as well as the fact that you have a new business, as well as the fact that you're probably capital constrained, the odds of you going broke in the first couple of years or getting divorced or hating your life or all three of those things is exceptionally high. And so you need to be very careful. And so you shouldn't use the projections of others to drive of what you project for your business. I'll get more into this one when I give you the five best decisions I made, but that'll be at the end of this video. Now, before I talk to you guys about my next big mistake, I did want to take a moment to talk about today's video sponsor, Magic Spoon. It is cereal reinvented. And today I got a special treat. Magic Spoon has some brand new flavors, and I'm particularly excited to test out this honey gram flavor. So you see, Magic Spoon is a high protein cereal with zero sugar. It's keto friendly, it's gluten free, it's grain free. Free. And as you guys know, I've been a Magic Spoon fan for a good long while. And particularly as I've worked to avoid sugar in my diet, eating Magic Spoon has allowed me to continue to enjoy the cereals I love, but avoiding the high sugar nature of most cereals. Growing up as a kid, I used to love to watch cartoons and eat my favorite honey graham cereal. I bet you guys know the one I'm talking about. And I am super curious to see how this one stacks up. Boom, right there, they nailed it. It tastes almost exactly like a certain high sugar honey graham cereal, but it does it without the sugar. I gotta admit, right now I'm very happy with my breakfast decision. And if you wanna try out Magic Spoon for yourself, click the link below to get some Magic Spoon cereal today. You can build your very own variety box and use my code Goldshaw Farm for $5 off. You can choose from the standard flavors like cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, birthday cake, and many more. Or you can test out the awesome new honey graham that I'm having for my breakfast today, or the toasted marshmallow that I'm excited to try for tomorrow. These campfire classic flavors are only available for a limited time. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product that it's backed by a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they will refund your money, no questions asked. So click the link below and use the code Goldshaw Farm or go to magicspoon.com slash Goldshaw Farm and you can save $5 off your order today. And for my British and Canadian friends, Magic Spoon ships to you too. So here we have the patient Pablo guarding over his catnip patch. That's going to be the patch where we produce our Pablo Escobar branded catnip. He's just sampling the product right now. It's okay. I gotta do some fencing stuff today, so no bike and I have to take the ATV. Good morning, weird chickens! Hey Bonnie, Belinda, come here. So we've got our two heifers actually in this paddock up here. Bonnie McMurray, who's the black one, the red one's named Belinda Carlisle. They're being kept separate from all the other cattle right now because I have my bull, Macho Man Randy Savage, in with the cows. And they're still a little bit too young to wanna get them pregnant. And so for this entire summer, they're gonna be red shirted and living alone here in this lower pasture and the adult cows are gonna be in that upper pasture. Which actually kind of brings me to the fourth point on my list, which is that when you're running a farm, all the pieces need to fit together. Hey girl, would you like a cube? Enjoy. Yeah, it's good to see you, sweetheart. I'll come by later today and visit with you face to face. But right now, I'll just give you a little quick fence feed. How about that? Yeah, you liking it up here? You and your sister? I know, Bonnie, you're shy. That's just how you roll. Linda's not nearly as shy though. She and Abby are friends. There is something really magical about driving into the abyss like this. Hey Abby, are you clocking in for another shift of work here with your cattle and chickens? Hang on, I gotta clean the lens off here. Got a little foggy and misty. So I'm still in the process of training Abby dog to this upper pasture and getting her ready to be the livestock guardian dog to help work with the cattle and the chickens. And I feel like every morning when I bring her up here, it's like that Looney Tune where like the dog is checking into work and like checking in with the coyote. Mojo. 
Lodge. Hello, Sam. It's got a very similar vibe to what happens here. But actually, Abby's presence up here with the cattle really does speak to a key lesson that I feel like I've learned over the last few years. And that's that all the pieces need to fit together. You know, if I think back to when I was living in Washington DC and only fantasizing about having a farm, I used to think about the different things that I would want to do, like an inventory checklist. Abby and her favorite playmate. <laughs> yeah, Lil Beatrix and Abby are like becoming the bestest of friends. It's, it's kind of funny to watch. The other cattle don't really like Abby's playfulness and it's one of the things that I'm trying to curb. But it seems like with little B, she just has a good time and they enjoy each other's company. Abby, hey, whoa, calm down. Hey, Abby, come. Of course, sometimes she gets a little worked up. But yes, I was saying, you know, I used to really think about it like I would have a checklist. Like I want to have chickens and I want to have ducks and I want to have cattle. And it was just this inventory of things that I would strive to add to my farm. But the longer I'm doing this, I'm realizing that it's more important to think about systems for your farm than just thinking about specific animals. So for example, we have all of this grass here on our farm and we're able to convert that grass into value by having cattle on there. And that means that we produce cattle that we can sell. We also produce beef that we can eat. And all of those things are a key part of our farm business. Okay, Audrey, you can have some more. Joey Ramon, I won't forget you either. But at the same time, it would have been a mistake for me to think about the cattle just by themselves. Like if you look right there, that's one of my fly traps. You know, one of the downsides to having cattle is their manure is gonna attract flies. And so I use the traps as well as the chickens to help control the flies. But the fact of the matter is my animals are up here right now in a semi-wild part of our farm. And so we have a lot of things like coyotes out here. And with those coyotes, I need to worry about them attacking things like our little calf Beatrix right there. And I also need to worry about them attacking my chickens. That's where our girl Abby Dog comes into play. You see, by having Abby Dog up here, what I'm able to do is have her become the apex predator. And she essentially creates a bubble that scares the coyotes and bobcats and bears away from this part of the farm. And so that effectively becomes the protection that I really need to keep my animals safe. If I had only been thinking about the cattle or if I'd only been thinking about the chickens, I wouldn't be thinking about how all of these things work together. And I feel like my farm business would be weaker. And I feel like my impact on the overall land of our farm would have been worse. For all of you guys out there dreaming of having a farm or a homestead, don't be just asking yourself what sorts of things you wanna grow or animals you wanna raise. Really focus your attention on how all of it fits together. I feel like that was a mistake I made early on and I'd recommend that you don't make that same mistake. Hang on girls, we're gonna be feeding you fresh grass in a second. They always get very impatient when they're moving to new pasture. Arguably the biggest and most fatal mistake I made when first starting out with the farm, and this one definitely far and away has the biggest long-term impact and consequences, was actually not prioritizing my own mental health enough particularly in those early years of the farm. You know, for a number of years when I was living in Washington DC, I was really unhappy and I had this dream of an idealized life here in Vermont and what it would look like if I moved up here and started a farm. And I'm not gonna deny in the least bit that leaving DC and moving to Vermont was not a good step in the right direction, but by no means was moving to the farm a solution to all my problems. And I know I spent a number of years here on the farm where I was still struggling and looking past my problems because I was so focused on chasing my dream. You know, for me, dream number one was quitting that DC job and moving to Vermont and starting the farm. But when I first moved up to Vermont, I still had a day job that I didn't love. And so then dream number two meant growing the farm and being successful enough that I could quit my day job and. Just just focus on the farm full time. But once I achieved that dream number two in 2022, I found myself still confronting some serious issues that I had. And it took a lot of work on myself and a lot of work on my mental health and prioritizing my mental health to really get myself on a track to where I feel like I'm heading towards a better place. And please hear me very clearly when I say that I have not achieved anything. I have not arrived at any destination. I just feel a heck of a lot better about the path I'm currently on and so much of that has been rooted in prioritizing my mental health. Chasing your dreams does not exempt you from focusing on addressing your problems of today. And if you achieve that dream, you're still gonna be left with the same problems. So you really need to deal with those issues and you can't just cover them up or look past them or ignore them. It is always going to come back and bite you in the butt. Hey, cows, come on, cows, fresh grass, fresh grass, come on.
Now, for most of my adult life, I have worked white collar office jobs. Meaning jobs that are cushy, jobs that are indoors, jobs where I either have a nice plush office or I'm working in a cubicle of some sort. And so for most of my professional life, that was my work experience. And to be quite honest, I was completely unprepared to the taxing toll that hard physical labor plays on you in a number of ways. And I totally discounted how hard the transition would be going from white collar worker to farm laborer. And I always conceptually knew that it was gonna be a lot of hard physical work. And in fact, that was part of what attracted me to it. But the truth of the matter is the difference between my expectations and the reality was much like the difference between shooting a bullet and throwing it. And I'm pretty sure I just ripped off the comedian Larry Miller with that line, but it's a good line. It may sound cliche, but farming requires a lot of hard physical work in a wide variety of environmental conditions. And five years in, I still find myself adjusting to that reality. Don't discount that universal truth when you're making your farm plans or you will find yourself sorely disappointed and probably just sore in general. There we go. Ready for some fresh water. Son of a gun, it's twisted. So I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I built Abby a new dog house. I just brought it up here the other day. It was a quickie build job, but I think it's gonna do very well for this summer. It really is just meant to be a summer shelter. Settle down, I know you're excited that I'm in your house with you, I know. You'll notice that there's a lot of good ventilation up top. It's really only designed to protect Abby from the rain and from the sun, because those are the biggest issues she's gonna have. Particularly for dogs like Toby and Abby, having too much of an overbuilt structure would actually make them not use it this time of year. And so for Abby, this is kind of perfect. It's got lots of dry straw for her to nap in, and it's got a nice big old roof. She seems to really like it, and so I'm very happy with how it turned out. I'm not sure about the placement of it right now. I kind of just have it right here dead in the middle of the field. Like you can see the chickens are over there, the cattle are over there, and so it gives her a spot to hang out in. The reality is her favorite spot to hang out in is like right on the ridge line overlooking the rest of the farm. I think there's something about the height that she seems to enjoy, but as I've been watching her, I've also noticed that she spent a fair amount of time hanging out in her little doggy house. So I feel like it's been a successful build. It's actually going to be easy enough to like move it around. I built the whole house on a pallet so I can just pick it up with the pallet forks on the tractor and move it to another spot on the farm if I want to. But for right now, this is what Abby's adjusting to. So Abby dog, I'm going to go down and do the rest of my chores and finish this video. And I am going to tell you guys the five best things that I did, but you're going to stay up here and watch the cattle and chickens. Okay. You ready for your job? I think she seems pretty content with her setup here. So the construction on the barn is nearly complete. I'm waiting on the electrical, which I don't think is gonna happen until August. And we're in the process of having the barn doors built right here on this side. But all the other carpentry stuff is fully complete. I have some projects myself for like really outfitting this thing that I need to do. Like for example, over there, like in that spot, I'm gonna ultimately be putting my hatchery. And so that'll be a project I probably don't tackle until the fall or the winter because it's not really weather dependent, but I need to have it done before spring. And yes, Ginny Barncat loves this new space. You know, Justin and his team did just an outstanding job in building this, and I'm really glad that I hired them and got their help. And that speaks to another big farm mistake I've made when I first was starting out. You know, just because you're starting a farm or a homestead because you want to lead a more self-sufficient life does not mean you could or should do everything all by yourself. I mean, here's another example. My buddy Alfred is in the process of building a retaining wall right here. So the wall is gonna kind of sit just right here. And then that's actually gonna be where the ramp is so I can drive my tractor up and down it and kind of loop around that oak tree there. I actually think right now, Alfred is over at the quarry getting some more stone. And I'm really glad I was able to hire him for this project because without the help of folks like my buddy Alfred, my buddy Alfred, I would never be able to do some of these things myself. Or if I tried to do them, they would have probably been single cheek exercises and not gone nearly as well. And so hiring people who are better than you to do certain projects that you need is not a bad thing and you shouldn't be afraid of it. Now that doesn't mean you should be hiring people to build your Ikea furniture, but it does mean you should be focusing on building the skills on the things that you're gonna do often and a lot and that need to be repeatable, but then also outsource the bigger tasks to the experts. Would you look at that? I got a lazy Pablo barn cat. I got a lazy Molly barn cat and I got a pacing 
hungry Ginny barn cat. And there truly is a balance you need to strike between rushing to hire a job out and waiting for the right time. You know, after we bought our house in 2016, very quickly we made plans to have it renovated and get it like in tip top condition for living. You know, we really struggled to do the renovation remotely. Like we were still living in Washington DC while renovating the house. Part of my impetus for rushing that was because I wanted to like have all the work done and not be living through a renovation and not have to move our stuff up and then move our stuff out and just be more efficient that way but we had never really lived in the house and so i feel like there were a lot of missed opportunities in the renovation and it was so much harder to like rush to get all of the renovation pieces done i think we would have been much better off doing some minor improvements that would have made the house livable and then at a much slower pace do the improvements that will make it the dream home that we've always wanted. Not to say it's not really our dream home now, it's just that there's things that we wish were better. And that ultimately speaks to a massive, massive mistake I made and a lesson that I've learned that when you're starting a farm and when you're setting something like this up, you need to be patient. If I had been more patient, I feel like that would have gone better. I think in other instances, I have been patient and it has been a slow build and that has helped me out a lot. But patience is so important and so many folks are just so eager to rush into things that they they make mistakes and they blow themselves up in the long haul by chasing the short-term objective. All right, all right, it's time to feed the barn cats. Let's go, guys. Molly, Ginny, Pablo, there you go. It always takes everybody a minute to figure out whose bowl is whose. Ginny, make some space for Molly, come on. There you go, Molly. Cats. Now I feel like this has been a decidedly negative video, so let me leave you with the five best choices I made when starting this farm. And probably number one actually starts with this guy right here. I spent so much time and energy and money trying to prevent predators on my farm from attacking my poultry. And the truth of the matter is that was a lot of wasted effort and energy. Livestock guardian dogs have been such a great addition to the farm. Well, that doesn't mean that they're not a lot of work and it doesn't mean that they don't have their own issues and trade-offs. Getting a livestock guardian dog is a great decision and I do not regret it one bit. All right, time to release the lunatics. Let's go, guys. It's so hysterical to watch the gosling horde just roam around the farm and tear into absolutely everything. They've got Toby Dog as a supervisor and they're able to just completely free range at this point. I still lock them up at night, but they'll probably go out free range full time probably by next week. I first started raising geese in 2019 and at this point I feel like I really know what I'm doing when it comes to raising geese. And that gets to a second great decision I made, which for the most part I have very much stuck with the policy of one animal per year. 2018 we added ducks 2019 we added geese and yeah we added chickens too but it's not that much more complicated 2021 we added cattle this year we've added pigs you know in early 2021 we added bees in like really late 2021 and into 2022 we added cattle and we added pigs here in 2023 and sort of each shift has given me an opportunity to build up some skills get past the learning curve of raising a new animal and get ready to be able to take on more stuff and over the years I've built an approach and systems that have made me much more efficient in raising all these animals. And if I had tried to do what I'm doing now, say four years ago, five years ago, I would have burnt myself out. I would have gotten completely overwhelmed and I would probably be back living in an East Coast city, working an office job, not even remotely doing anything like this. And I'd probably also be divorced too. So very important, remember, one animal per year. Then as you get that one down, you can go on to the next one. The third good decision I made was actually not quitting my day job. You know, when I left my job in Washington DC, I actually moved to a new job here in Vermont. It was like a career step backwards. It was a pretty big pay cut, but at the same time, it was a move in the direction towards my dreams. And so really from 2018 until uh, January of 2022, I was both doing the farm as well as working a day job. It started out, it was like about an hour commute away. Eventually, Especially with the pandemic, it switched to remote, which did make my life a little bit easier. And I probably kept working for a year more than I actually needed to, but doing that was really good because number one, it really forced me to prioritize my time and focus on getting more and more efficient. But then number two, it also meant I wasn't putting it all on the line with the farm. Like I have seen so many people try to start farms and they start out full time year one and they have not built up the clientele or the business model that's gonna reasonably sustain 
between them. And so the rate of success is significantly lower versus the approach that I took where I started out as a part-time farmer and grew the farm. And over time, it got to be a point where things were so big that I needed to go full-time with the farm, which was most definitely a good problem to have. Uh-oh, the group just split up. Like these guys are over here. Those guys are over there. I find that they split up a lot. Like, actually, I have, there's another group back there. They make like clusters of like, I don't know, four or five birds at a time. And, and so that just seems to be how they work. I think the other good decision, another thing that actually really came from having that day job was I've never gone in debt to invest in my farm. I always had the cash on hand to tackle the next enterprise. Whether it was cash flowing my duck egg operation by harvesting male ducks for me, or buying my cattle herd using the money that I earned through YouTube. All of those new activities required cash and I never took out a loan to do it. Look, you already have enough strikes against you when you're a beginning farmer and you're just starting out. I think if you end up trying to put yourself in debt and you have to manage servicing that debt alongside starting a successful business, that's just a lot of pressure and I think it's very hard for people to overcome and I think it significantly lowers your odds. That's why I believe that the combination of being a part-time farmer, cash flowing your business yourself, and then getting that initial movement and momentum going organically, it really is the only way to set yourself up for that long-term success. And yes, I know I would be a big old lying liar if I didn't acknowledge the fifth good decision that I made, which is actually starting all my social media accounts and documenting the farm on social media. I feel like our farm kind of hit like a lottery ticket with how the content sort of took off and how it's been a very successful and lucrative part of our farm business. And I need to caution everybody to say that that is completely abnormal and you should not expect to be able to do something similar. But I do think for absolutely everybody who ever dreams of starting any sort of commercial enterprise from a farm or homestead, you need to be thinking about how you're going to market and sell your products and you need to think about how you're going to tell your farm story. Whether it's putting out 20 minute long lectures like this one or just even snapping a couple of quick pictures for Instagram every day, how you tell your farm story is going to help you ultimately market and sell your products and ultimately ultimately help you sustain your farm. And so while I know that there's a lot of old school folks out there who might look down upon the idea of trying to market yourself or create content as part of your farm business plans, I think it's completely turning a blind eye to the realities of farm businesses in 2023 and beyond. So definitely don't sleep on that one. And if you wanna learn more, you should probably watch that video right there. I hope you guys have found this one helpful. And if you have more questions about everything I laid out here in today's video, be sure to drop some comments down below and I'll try to maybe make a follow-up.